I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about how China's defense base is growing much larger than the United States in some cases, and that China is increasingly on a wartime footing, while here at home in the United States we're on a peacetime footing, we have with us... As you know, I'm one of my favorite guests ever, if not my favorite guest on the podcast, Dr. Seth Jones. Seth is our Harold Brown Chair, Senior Vice President, and Head of the International Security Program. Seth, I'm so happy you're here to talk about this new report you have, Rebuilding the Arsenal of Democracy. I want to ask you about the title, but I also want to ask you, like, what prompted you to write about this? You premiered it on Aaron Burnett's show on CNN the other night. Uh, the Wall Street Journal talks about it in an editorial. This is this is big, important stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's really important stuff. People like to focus primarily on things like, you know, military operations, but you can't conduct deterrence overseas or war fighting without having the equipment uh, necessary to do all that. And that's really where the defense industrial base comes in. Okay, so tell, give me some of the headlines of this report. Your report is talking about how China's defense industrial base is outpacing the United States. Can you elaborate on where, what areas this is? I mean, some of the stats that you have in this report are kind of startling. One of them is China is now the world's largest shipbuilder and has a shipbuilding capacity that is roughly 230 times that of the United States. That's astonishing. It is astonishing. I, I think you know our judgment on Chinese uh, defense industrial capabilities is that they are on a wartime footing. That doesn't mean war is imminent per se, but what is what it means is they are building the capabilities to conduct a war, and a war in particular with the United States. That is high-end capabilities, everything from hypersonics to uh, command and control networks, battle networks, to fight a high-end adversary, and not just anyone, but the, the U.S. So when we look at some of the things that are striking about the Chinese now, it's things like the size of their defense companies that are building it. We see some of the largest defense companies in the world now are not just the uh, Northrop's or the Lockheed's, but also now China North Industries Group Corporation, Aviation Industry Corporation of China, and they are producing an increasing and growing quantity and quality of land, maritime, air, space, and other capabilities. Uh, China announced earlier this year that it is increasing its defense budget by 7.2% wow. this year. And when you look at things like how quickly it's acquiring high-end weapon systems, so from the research and development phase to the acquisition phase, uh, it's acquiring them, according to some U.S. government estimates, five to six times faster. So the acquisition process, not only is it shrinking in China, but it's also moving faster than the U.S., which is bogged down, slow, it's not particularly flexible. And then a couple of other areas, Shipbuilding really struck us as an area where there's an increasing divergence. That is, China is the world's largest shipbuilder. In terms of capacity, it has an extraordinary capacity to build ships, as you noted, roughly 230 times the capacity of the U.S. And when you look at, as an example, one of China's shipyards, Zhongnan Shipyard, which is outside of Beijing, it has more capacity. That doesn't necessarily mean it's producing ships at this rate, but it has the capacity to produce uh, more ships than all U.S. shipyards combined. What it gives you is a sense of how serious the Chinese are about developing the capabilities of their defense industrial base. You know, I, I, I do think it's important to caveat that a little bit by saying that China is not entirely 10 feet tall. I mean, it is building a web of integrated air defense systems. It's building long-range strike. It's building nuclear capabilities. But it also has challenges. It's, you know, corruption, morale. It has no recent warfighting experience. It has, it has other challenges. Its anti-submarine warfare capabilities are not great right now. Our Navy submariners tell us that, that uh, they, the Chinese really can't find U.S. submarines. So they're not good in that combination of s dropping sauna buoys, collecting intelligence. So this doesn't necessarily mean the Chinese in all areas 
are this huge 10 foot tall behemoth. But what it does say is they are increasingly cutting cutting or shrinking the gap with the U.S. Well, yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. They're shrinking the gap. Aren't they sort of playing catch up with us? They are playing catch up with us. But look, there are some really important areas like hypersonics and stealth where they are catching up in very important ways. And frankly, on in, on shipbuilding, I, I think the evidence is is actually not just catching up. It's surpassed us on their surpassed. on their ability to build a range of different kinds of ships. I mean, if you look at the satellite imagery, for example, of some of their big shipyards, they're now producing aircraft carriers at them. Uh, so the, the right. Chinese are producing aircraft carriers. Again, you know, there's a difference between quantity and quality, but on their ability to mass produce weapon systems, in some areas, they are definitely surpassing the United States. So to put this in perspective, historically, the United States has spent a lot on defense. And most people would say, well, we're still spending a lot on defense. Are we actually in relative terms? Well, you know, what is interesting is is one of the things that's important to look at is how much the U.S. spends on defense as a percentage of gross domestic product or GDP. And when you look at historical trend lines, actually, it's, it's actually interesting. We are spending since the uh, very early part of the Cold War, so like, let's say 1950, right around the time of the Korean War, we are spending all-time lows on defense as a percentage of GDP. All-time lows now. All-time lows. Uh, That's hard to absorb. Yeah, so uh, defense spending peaked around 14% of how much the U.S. spent as a percentage of GDP around the Korean War. But chunks of, uh, of the Cold War, especially the early Cold War, we were spending 10%, 11%. And this was including during years like um, Kennedy. So these were Democratic and Republican administrations. By the 1980s, during the Reagan buildup, the U.S. spent about 6%, somewhere in the 6% category of GDP. Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, it's all high. It decreases a bit when you get to Reagan, I suppose, or Carter. And it does decrease as a percentage of GDP below 6% in the immediate post-Vietnam War year, so late 1970s during Carter, right. and then comes back up during Reagan. Right. I think you're like, you're at the height of the Cold War at that point, Reagan, and then during the Gorbachev, uh, Reagan years. Uh, and then it actually stays somewhere in that 6%, 5% category, but we're at 3% right now. We're at 3% right now. Yes. That's incredible. Why is that? The lows started to happen around the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, so the numbers started to, to shrink. Uh, it, we didn't think we needed big things anymore. I mean, we probably didn't in some ways. And then 9-11 comes. So, so during that period, the U.S. defense industry is subjected to what's called the Last Supper, where uh, senior Pentagon leaders essentially tell the defense industry, the Lockheeds and others, that they've got to consolidate. So we, we went from a lot of defense companies depending on how you count them, uh, high-end and mid-tier mid, mid, mid -tier ones, over 100 down to five big primes. And, and I'm including a lot of different types of defense companies in that, but a lot of consolidation. 9-11 happens. You don't need a lot of big stuff necessarily because you're fighting the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and then the Islamic State. So you need joint direct attack munitions, drones, not necessarily lots of your high-end uh, weapons systems and really expensive ones because you're not necessarily fighting or preparing to fight big states. This is really the age of asymmetric warfare. Yeah, asymmetric and irregular warfare. And obviously that starts to change in the last five to 10 years. Probably you really first see it during the Trump administration, during the national defense strategy, which shifts to strategic competition. And it continues under the Biden administration where there is a real focus on the Chinese and then the Russians, which uh, do their initial invasion of take Crimea and then start the war in Eastern Ukraine in 2014, but really start picking things up in 2022 when they invade uh, invade Ukraine in a conventional manner. So I, I think we're, 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 we're certainly in a stage, much like part of the Cold War, where we, the US, really is, is no longer in a period of that asymmetric and irregular threats. We don't see a lot of plotting against the U.S. homeland from those groups, but we see a lot of activity from big states. Some people would say we're in an age of a new Cold War. 
Yeah, and in some ways, it's definitely not a Cold War. We've got a hot war in Ukraine. The Russians have rattled a nuclear saber. Uh, They invaded Ukraine. We've got an active hot war in in and around Israel, too, and not just in Israel, but a lot of fire uh, between the Israelis and Hezbollah in Lebanon. And the Houthis. And the Houthis in the Red Sea. And we've seen activity in Syria and Iraq. And then the U.S. has lost soldiers in Jordan, too. So there's a hot element to this, not just a Cold War. Right. So I think when, when I say Cold War and when people say Cold War, they're thinking about this competition with China. And when we think about comp- or when we have thought mostly about competition with China, we think about technology, we think about silicon chips, we think about, um, you know, how we're going to try to keep the Chinese from getting our most sensitive of technologies. But this is something altogether different. This is a different kind of competition you're talking about. It is a different uh, kind of competition, or, or at least it's, it's more than just that. Um, some of those things are important because you certainly need artificial intelligence. Quantum computing, machine learning are important for the defense industrial base, but also so are ships, so are fifth generation aircraft, particularly stealth ones, so are long range precision strike, which incidentally do require chips. So, so are satellites and space, cyber, uh, these are all important dimensions in addition to uh, just the economic side. Your report is really raising something of an alarm bell. You know, as you point out, four of the world's 10 largest defense companies are now Chinese enterprises. What are the challenges that the U.S. defense industrial base has right now? And why do we seem to be falling behind, at least in this short term? Well, I think one thing that the U.S. lacks right now, and it's interesting when you compare the current period of the United States to previous major periods where there is growing concern about this type of competition. Uh, So think about the pre-World War II period um, and Roosevelt. Uh, Think about the Truman period in the late 1940s or in the early 1950s. Eisenhower in the late 1950s, Reagan in the 1980s, uh, they became concerned about the state of the U.S. defense industrial base. And I think what one commonality between a range of these presidents is they then adopted national programs to reinvigorate, revitalize the defense industrial base. In, In other words, it was a national priority. So what came out of that were Roosevelt's creation of the National Defense Advisory Commission, and then the Office of Production Management, and then the War Production Board. And this is where you take the title, Rebuilding the Arsenal of Democracy from, correct? Yeah. So Roosevelt has this major speech. This is before the U.S. even gets involved in the war itself. And he says, and I'm quoting here, talking about the importance of rebuilding. He says, quote, I want to make it clear that it is the purpose of the nation to build now with all possible speed. And again, remember the U.S. is not at war here. All possible speed, every machine, every arsenal, every factory that we need to manufacture our defense material. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. Again, U.S. not at war. Uh, We must apply ourselves to our task with the same resolution, Roosevelt continues, the same sense of urgency, the same sense of patriotism and sacrifice as, as we would show, were we at war? Again, this is preparing for what eventually does come, but think of this less as just war fighting, but also for deterrence. You need these capabilities so that bad actors don't take steps like invade countries, or if they, and if they do, that you are prepared. And, and that's kind of what, that's what's missing right now. People think of the defense industrial base and the broader ecosystem, ecosystem as just the Department of Defense. But actually, when you look at foreign military sales, technology transfers, you gotta bring in the uh, State Department commerce, you've gotta bring in Congress. And I think what's- Treasury. Mi- Treasury, what is missing right now is this sort of sense of urgency that there is much more at stake than just the Defense Department. This really has to be a White House initiative. So one of the big things that we're pushing for is a national level body. There have been various 
examples of this in U.S. history to really take this issue seriously. First of all, it's got to create a sense of urgency. It's got to help determine policies, plans, and procedures for what the federal government should do regarding defense procurement, arms sales, uh, production, technology transfers, establish priorities, fix the immense bureaucratic problems that exist, incentivize industry, improve communication, and again, as I said earlier, provide a sense of urgency. That is lacking right now. Okay, so explain why the current system is so, or seemingly so gummed up. Well, there are a couple of areas that I think are worth highlighting. And, and there has been improvement. I mean, there's a, there is a, a, a new national defense industrial base strategy that the Pentagon put out. It definitely is a helpful step in the right direction. I think when you look at senior Pentagon officials, whether it's Undersecretary of Defense Bill LaPlante or um, Andrew Hunter or uh, a range of others, um, they, are re- they, they recognize the challenges it's just, I mean, in some ways, it's above just the Department of Defense. But some of the key issues that I would highlight are first contracting. There are a range of munitions, for example, where the we lack. I mean, our war games show that we run out of munitions, key munitions, in a protracted war in the in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Congress has been reticent to um, not just authorize but um, appropriate the money for multi-year buys of these key munitions. And you cannot expect the defense industry to build up stockpiles without being paid over multi-years. So contracting is problematic on multiple ends. And when you say Indo-Pacific, you're talking about something like China potentially invading Taiwan, the U.S. comes to Taiwan's aid, and then as our war games have shown, Mark Kansian, and there's a great Wall Street Journal video out right now where Mark is going through the, the, his paces of the, uh, the war game, you're saying we could literally run out of stuff. Of some stuff, yeah, like long-range anti-ship missiles, uh, LRASMs, we could run out. I mean, our war games sh- indicate that uh, in a number of the iterations, we run out in a week, roughly, uh, of LRASMs. So, yeah, so our stockpiles. Uh, and industry is going to be deeply rel- uh, reticent to, to produce requisite stockpiles, essentially without assurances. That they can sell it. That they can sell it. So over multiple years, because the problem ends up being that Congress might authorize a certain number of of, uh, munitions, but the services by the end of a fiscal year may decide, and they often do decide not to buy. They're going to put their money somewhere else. So a multi-year is an assurance. So that's one big one. There are a few others. Workforce is deeply strained right now. Um, Explain why. What, why is that? Well, uh, uh, shipyards are probably a very good example of this where um, there's just a lack of welders. People willing, willing to come in, whether it's the Virginia or Columbia class uh, submarines or whether it's other types of ships, uh, there's an there's a insufficient supply of welders, uh, including nuclear welders. And people have decided for the moment they're going to work it, and, and I'm not making this up, a place like Walmart instead of, uh, instead of welding. Uh, I don't understand that. Wouldn't you get paid a lot more to weld a nuclear sub than to work at Walmart? Well, some of our subs are built in places like Connecticut, uh, at Groton, gets cold there, or Quonset Point, Rhode Island, and conditions in, a, you know, in some cases... Uh, uh, people have been willing to work inside of Walmart rather than in what could be tough conditions in a shipyard. So it's not just pay itself, although pay is part of it as well. You know, part of it also indicates that that I think there have to be more investments in high schools and colleges on the technology side so that... Training. Training, yeah. Training and vocational training. And then also there's, I think there's a public relations component too that this is a, it's actually a good path for work. So there's the workforce issue. Supply chains are definitely a challenge as well. It's, and it's not just the COVID period, but there are some supply chains that are slowing down the acquisition process. And then, you know, one of the biggest issues that we found was our foreign military sales and technology transfers to key partners and allies, including the Australians and the British, the, the UK, that we are really slow in providing 
that kind of um, uh, technology transfers to our allies and partners who we're going to be fighting with. So we have a lot of comments on. Is that because we're worried about giving, even to the five eyes, are we worried about giving, you know, critical technology to even our greatest allies? When you look at foreign military sales and technology transfers, it's important to protect American technology, particularly sensitive ones. So there is, there is an important aspect of protecting it. However, the challenge is, and we've got a lot of examples of this, one interesting example is with the United Kingdom. There were a range of delays about a routine upgrade on sonar systems for the UK Royal Navy submarines. And the delay was several months. And it was, they had to wait to be cleared by a U.S. Department of State um, export control component. So, I mean, this is a 5 eye partner. This is, this is another example. Months went by, as one analysis concludes, by waiting for a license that just added cost and risk to an ally's military capability. We found that the, the U.K. spends a shocking $500 million each year, almost 1% of its defense budget, complying with U.S. ITAR regulations. Those are technology transfers. That's probably the closest U.S. This is a, a country that the U.S. shares its most exquisite intelligence with. It's a five eyes partner, along with the Australians, the Canadians, and New Zealand. And yet it takes too long to share sensitive technology. Andrew, I cannot think of a single case of a military operation, major military operation, where the United States is not going to operate with its closest partners, particularly the UK. It's amazing. So, Seth, I, you know, I want to go back to supply chain issues. So, isn't if we're having supply chain issues, aren't the Chinese also having supply chain issues? I understand the workforce thing. China can throw, you know, millions and millions of people at workforce issues. We can't. It's not as easy for us here. And these enterprises that are these these big defense companies in China, of course, they're affiliated or owned by the government. So, but aren't they facing some of the same supply chain? Absolutely. China is definitely facing supply chain issues including with chips. I mean, the whole Chips Act that the uh, uh, Biden administration has enacted has made it more difficult for China to get access to some advanced chips. So some of those chips are incredibly important for China's uh, precision weapon systems and other types of advanced weapon systems. So China has challenged, I mean, that's one example, I think, where China has some supply chain issues. On the other hand, and this is the other side of the coin, China also dominates the advanced battery supply chain across the globe and components of it. So lithium hydroxide, electrolyte, lithium carbonate, anodes, cathodes. So, so the U.S. also has to rely on countries like China for critical defense components or things like um, titanium uh, from the Russians. So, you know, all, all of these major countries certainly have some supply chain issues, not just the U.S. So today, as we discussed, the U.S. defense budget is roughly 3% of GDP. How feasible in this environment is it for the United States to increase its defense spending and really get at this problem that you've identified? Well, I think when you look at resistance to some of what we talk about in the report, there definitely is political resistance. There's certainly resistance to a higher defense budget. I mean, there's no question that when it comes to... And it's coming from both the right and the left, correct? Yeah. There are many who argue that the U.S. has other priorities. Those priorities include things like border security. Uh, they include the U.S. domestic economy. They may include drugs uh, and uh, uh, concerns about proliferation of different types of uh, illegal drugs in U.S. communities. So, I mean, there are a range of, of priorities that, that are understandable. There are also those that, that are concerned about increasing the defense budget because it might lead to more fraud, waste, and abuse, or it may mean more money for, quote, greedy uh, defense companies. So there certainly is resistance to increasing the defense budget. The reality, I would argue, though, is the U.S. finds itself, along with its allies and partners, in a, an increasingly competitive environment where countries like Russia have invaded neighbors. The Chinese are building their defense industrial bases, so, so the U.S. 
defense budget does not operate in a vacuum. And when you look historically at periods of heightened competition, the U.S. comparatively, it's a low percentage right now. And I think there are going to be costs to that. Well, Seth, I mean, this has really given us something to think about. And I know this report has given policymakers and the media something to think about as well. Thank you for this. And thank you for helping us better understand and get to the truth of the matter about this disparity right now. Andrew, as always, thank you very much. This is uh, this is a great discussion and a really important issue. People often sort of underplay uh, the defense industrial base, but it is really at the heart of defense. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 